Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about race and racism again. Today's episode follows on from episode 51, which was made up of excerpts from interviews with Asa Mittman, Damien Fleming, Dimitri Nikasis, Donna Zuckerberg, Helen Young, Catherine Blouin, Rebecca Fudo Kennedy, and Usama Ali Gad. In the first part of the conversations, we talked about the problems with race and racism that are facing the disciplines of classics and medieval studies. In today's episode, they discuss how they are responding to those challenges and give suggestions for how people can try to make a positive difference. We hope that this will start productive conversations, and we would very much like to hear from you about your ideas and experiences. Have you had any successes? Any approaches you definitely wouldn't recommend? Get in touch on Twitter or in the comments on the website, or contact any of the people we talk to directly. Their contact info is on the website. All right, for this episode, we're drinking the Optimist cocktails, because that's what we need to be, I think. This recipe is almost an actual recipe that I found on the internet. There were multiple versions of this though. Some of them had fresh basil and ginger syrup and other, one had hibiscus syrup, but I've decided that we need realistic optimism. So I made a (laughs) fairly down to earth version with what we had, including a slight substitution of a little bit of Rose's lime for a little simple syrup because I ran out of simple syrup. So it'll be what it is. But basically it is white rum, fino sherry, lime juice, sugar syrup, and Peychaud's bitters, which is why, Mark, it's pink. Ah. It's the Peychaud's bitters. It's the Peychaud's bitters. Okay. I'll uh, put a link to the recipe in the show notes, but it's the Optimist cocktail by Difford. So shall we try this? Hmm. See if it makes us optimistic. Hmm. Maybe too limey with the lime and the rose's lime as well. But it's nice. Yeah, I like it. Mm. Quite refreshing Mm. tasting. So you like this one better than the last one, eh? Oh, yeah. Okay, so that was good. Well, let's keep that optimism going then and turn to responses to the problem. Many of the people we talked to stressed that the first and most important response is to acknowledge and talk about the problems that exist in both disciplines, as Helen Young, Dimitri Nakasis, and Damien Fleming explain. I struggle with this question, honestly. I do, because most of my work is so focused on getting people to recognise that there's something wrong and getting people to recognise what the problems are, that turning around and saying, what do we do about them? I guess my first answer to the the question of what do we do about these problems is that people need to recognise and acknowledge that they are problems before there's anything else to do. So in practical terms, I think that doing the kind of work that says, okay, well, look at how our discipline was constructed. Look at the history of our discipline and think about the legacies of that history in the present on how we teach, on what we research, on how we think. I think really engaging with where our disciplines came from is a really important step. And a lot of medieval studies people kind of still don't think about medievalism as something that's worth paying attention to. So I think it's very difficult to change what we do that's problematic. It's very difficult to change what's problematic unless you recognize that there is a problem and what it is. As a general statement, I guess, you know, I see that classics hasn't really fully confronted its past in the way that other disciplines have. You know, if you think of the way like anthropology as a discipline has tried to confront the past of the discipline I mean, you can say that they it's not adequate. I'm sure that it's not. But, you know, there is a there's a real discourse that's identifiable, that's scholarly, where people are really continue to struggle with it. And I think in that respect, we're behind. So I think these continued conversations are are a really big step forward and they, they need to continue. And it's never going to be over. I think there, there can be this sense like, oh, when are we finally going to get past this? Like, we're never going to get past this. <laughs> This has to be a constant conversation. It has to be if we're going to to retain any kind of like cultural currency moving forward. And I think it it brings a vitality to the discipline. I mean, I know not everyone's going to be interested in doing it, but you know, some people have to be interested in doing it, and I think it'll make the discipline more interesting as a result. 
how I think, you know, many of us scholars of medieval and classical literature kind of just blithely accepted that our material was not political and that, you know, that's just we can't operate like that. We shouldn't have ever been operating that way. And, you know, I can look around and see all kinds of scholars who are <laughs> so much better at awareness than I am. So being aware of this and then directly addressing it when we're dealing with these texts, you know, finding out like, what do students expect to learn in a class on Old English or, you know, what are they bringing to it? And directly addressing it, talking about things like you know, when you rework the Middle Ages, what you're doing or when you make choices to cast a movie based in the Middle Ages, like what is going on so that, you know, we, we can't rely on our students to, you know, make these connections necessarily, even if it's not the, you know, the focus of the entire class, but just to make it enough of a focus, make it a, a point of conversation, uh, acknowledging our own biases when we're interpreting this literature and this material, and then therefore the biases of previous generations, even people we, you know, greatly respect or have been inspired by, like people like Tolkien and Lewis. Now, these are by no means the only disciplines that have faced these issues, as Catherine Blouet and Helen Young mention. I went to a conference at the British Museum two years ago, and there was a keynote speech on religion in uh, the ancient uh, world or in uh, Hellenistic and Roman Egypt. And I thought it was great. And, you know, there was a certain engagement with, you know, multidisciplinarity and postcolonial theory and so on. And um, two uh, friends of mine who are anthropologists came along and I asked them after what they thought and I asked them separately and they both told me the same thing without knowing what the other had said, which was, it was very interesting, but I'm quite surprised because we've had these conversations in anthropology over 30 years ago, you know, and it was from a wonderful scholars in our field whom I highly respect. It was a great talk. So it really speaks to how we, we need to catch up. There's a lot of catching up to do. It's very like some of the things that when I wrote the fat book on fantasy, I actually thought it wasn't going to be a medievalist project. I'd done my PhD in medieval studies and there hasn't been a medieval studies, entry-level medieval studies job in Australia since 2003 in Middle English, which is what my PhD was in. So I, I, I knew there was going to be no job for me in the country. So I, I started sort of reorienting the work I was doing and I sort of thought I'm going to do fantasy. I'm not going to do medievalism. But, you know, they were so, so connected that I'm not really sure how I thought that would actually be possible. But I, I worked in that book on fan communities and, and because a lot of, you know, I've written about this recently on In the Middle, a lot of what's happened in medieval studies is very, very like some of the things that were happening in, in science fiction and fantasy fandom getting on towards a decade ago. And it's a similar, I think it's a similar sort of thing that, you know, fans, when you say, hey, this text that you love is deeply racist for many many people the response to that is no it's not i'm not racist so this text can't be racist you're racist for pointing that out understanding the history of the disciplines helps us think about how we can and should construct and describe our disciplines today here damien dimitri nakasis and usama ali god highlight different ways this can work i'm partly guilty of not being as actively, either as actively aware or actively addressing these kind of issues in my classroom for the last 10 years. I think especially, you know, people like me and Mark and other scholars who do old school philology, like we've always kind of collectively been aware of the fact that like 19th century philology grows out of and alongside European nationalism, the quest for Germanic literature goes hand in hand with like the rise of what leads to World War II Nazism. I kind of would address this a little bit in classes like History of the English Language and maybe in Old English, but not as a pressing concern. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I would bring these things up almost as like a historical curiosity that 100 years ago, people were talking about the Middle Ages or using medieval literature, medieval Germanic literature in these potentially racist ways without fully realizing until, you know, the last year or so that, no, this has never stopped. Like, and it's perhaps even more intense now. We need to directly address it because it's such an important issue. So I was having an, a conversation on Twitter 
with somebody about to what extent the entire discipline is implicated in kind of narrative that maybe not all of us would agree with, right? That is to say, is is the mere fact of being a classicist, or if you're teaching, I don't know, the objective and subjective genitive, isn't that somehow value neutral? And you know, sure it is. But one thing I was trying to say was that Fred Jameson in The Political Unconscious has this whole thing about how periodization imposes narratives. If you periodize archaic classical Hellenistic, that really constrains the types of, if you use that periodization, if you don't question that periodization, that really constrains how you think about the Greek past, the ancient Greek past, right? Or ancient medieval modern, right, is another sort of problematic one. You could say a similar thing is kind of true of disciplines. That if you say, well, what we do is we do the classics, and that's its own discipline that's distinct from, you know, religious studies and history and anthropology and whatever else you like, and that, you know, these texts are at the core of our discipline. That's not problematic in and of itself, but these divisions of disciplines do kind of constrain the way we think about the ancient past in in some basic way. And so, you know, I think it's good for us to realize that, you know, our disciplines are important. They give us a lot of, they let us say a lot of things. They they let us be specialists in in weird little corners, um, like, like Linear B for me, that let us say really important and interesting things about the ancient world that we wouldn't be able to say if we were you know, if we were trained in some other way. So, you know, they're good for sure. I'm not trying to destroy classics at all, but they also are arbitrary and, you know, historically speaking, and they do affect the way that we think and the way that we act and whom we talk to and the way we self-identify and the kinds of questions we ask. So, you know, I think it is important for us to think about those things because it wasn't like, decreed from on high that classic shall be a discipline and, you know, anthropology be, will be its own discipline. These are all like, I don't know, kind of historical accidents and they change the way that we do the things that we do. Yeah, it's very interesting to see that I'm not only the only person to say that. Actually, Taha Hussein, you, you may recognize the name. Uh, he is a very influential, influential Egyptian writer and intellectual. And he has also the same idea, you know, that the Greek and Latin heritage is our heritage, you know. And he has wrote a, a lot about this in his book, which is called, you know, translated in English as The uh, Future of Culture in Egypt. And this was in 1934, so that quite a long time, you know. But his ideas uh, have not resonated in the educational system in Egypt. You know. But at least he is the one who, who is behind our department. Uh, in the whole Arab world, you will not find any Greek and Latin department except in Egypt. I mean, we have many departments. In the university in which I am teaching, in Cairo University, we have a department. And also in Alexandria University and many other regional universities uh, here in Egypt. So, But in the whole Arab world, you will not find any Greek or Latin. I mean, I mean philological development. You will have history, you will have uh, archaeology, you will have philosophy departments, but uh, philological development of Greek and Latin is only found in Egypt because this person. And he was a professor of Arabic literature, which is very interesting in itself, you know. So, for example, like if we think that what's interesting about Greece is that it's part of this really dynamic Eastern Mediterranean zone of interaction and that we can see so much coming into the Greek world from outside, but maybe from outside is not the way, even the right way to think about it, right? That Greece is not its own thing, right? But it's always part of this Eastern Mediterranean network. So there's, there are ideas, goods and people and languages moving back and forth you know, over millennia. That's great, but then how do we talk about that? Well, like, I'm not an expert in Anatolia. Frankly, I'm, like, embarrassed at the lack of knowledge I have about Anatolia and basically all periods. <laughs> Late Bronze Age and Achaemenid, Anatolia, and all of that stuff. I don't know the languages of the ancient Near East, right? I can't read Ugaritic or Aramaic or Akkadian or any of that stuff. And so it puts us somewhat in an awkward position. I mean, our, we have Greek and Latin sources that talk about other places and other peoples 
But, you know, if we really want to break out and think of our field as a kind of ancient Mediterranean environment and endeavor, that's challenging too, because most of us, frankly, just don't have the skills, whether they're linguistic or, or archaeological or whatever, to really speak to that in a robust way. But however difficult these topics are, issues of race or other problems in our texts or in the scholarship about them, progress is not made by ignoring or covering them over. Damien demonstrates this with an example of a missed opportunity, while Donna Zuckerberg says that the attitude of the majority of classicists, at least, has changed quite a lot in recent months. So I'll start with a kind of negative exemplum, as we say in medieval studies, of a, a good friend of mine who works on rape in medieval literature. One of her professors, who is a, a Chaucer expert, we were talking about Chaucer and like Chaucer, the, the historical person we know was accused uh, or he settled an accusation of rape against him. You know, we have like the court documents relating to this, very minimal court documents, but it's like he paid a fine relating to a rape that he was accused of. And this is, you know, a, a kind of a huge thing for a historical author who we, uh, or we don't know a wealth of material about his life, but we have a wealth of literature, much of which deals with issues of rape. So I was talking to this friend of mine, kind of a junior scholar, and she was saying that her very famous professor would not allow discussion of the charge of rape against Chaucer in her classroom. And, you know, it's like, that's just the way it was. Like, this will not contribute to... This, this doesn't influence his literature, which kind of blew my mind. But I guess at the same time, because Chaucer is not my primary focus and I've not devoted my life to this literature, I kind of, you know, I introduce it and we spend a lot of time talking about it and students are really interested in it. And, you know, maybe from a certain point of view, they get too interested in it. I think that's the fear of like, now this is going to overshadow anything they ever think about this man, which I would imagine is the logic behind this older professor's refusal to allow discussion of it in her classroom. But I think, I, I mean, I think that's a just a dreadful error to prevent discussion of these kind of issues in our classrooms and that we should be doing the complete opposite, which is promoting them. So in a case like that, where there's unambiguous historical evidence, which parallels all kinds of material in his literature, I think it's irresponsible to hide it from students. When I first published How to Be a Good Classicist Under a Bad Emperor in November 2016, there was a lot of pushback that I experienced, really to the degree of even, is this really a thing that is happening? Are white supremacists really interested in the classics? And then there were other people who were sort of thinking, maybe this is happening, but is it something that we should be concerned with? And a year later, I would say it's a general consensus that it is something that's happening. And probably at least a large minority, if not a slight majority, think that it is something that we should be working to, to confront in some way or combat. It's such a large and multifaceted problem. So obviously the, the solution will have to be equally multiform. And then I don't think any one person could be part of the entire solution. But this, whatever the solution looks like, it will have to be some combination of creating a more diverse and inclusive discipline professionally in terms of the, the, the makeup of, of the professoriate of classicists and also working to, to have a more inclusive and diverse set of students, bringing in a larger variety of perspectives about the ancient world and what the ancient world looks like. I think that the push to make sure that when others are trying to represent the ancient world or classical antiquity as white, the push to say, well, this is not just about ancient Greece and Rome, it's about Egypt and Mesopotamia and all these other places is a very healthy one. And also, also working to bring in more female perspectives, more slave perspectives. So that's all really sort of inside the discipline. Although the problem is large, many solutions may start with small-scale individual actions, suggests Catherine. I tend to believe in, you know, small action, like you do what you can in the way you can, you know, and I believe that the sum of small actions is will lead you farther than having really two grandiose ideas. So I have a lot of I small ideas, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to implement some of them in the way I, I teach and I conduct research. So I, I think, well, if you think, if, if you're teaching ancient history or classics, 
well, how, how can you engage with issues of the interaction between imperialism, race, and ancient literature or ancient history in your classroom? When you, you can, you know, now what I've started doing is, for instance, in seminars, I add a first I'm now systematically planning one or two weeks at the beginning of term where we look more at the historiography and at post-colonial approaches to the topic. There's not a lot done. There is more and more, but there's still a lot to be done. So sometimes I will, you know, they'll have to read stuff outside of ancient history. But that's not bad, you know. I think it, it can be inspiring to them. So, you know, you can, you can do that. You can approach certain topics that allow for these conversations and that are more focused on ancient dynamics in your, in your syllabi. Um, you know, we have quite a bit of freedom in general in the way we develop our courses, and we're very fortunate for that. So I think this is something that everyone who teaches can do. Uh, people who, who are asked to, you know, revise or write textbooks for high schools, maybe try to, you know, have a bit more firm conversations with publishers to take out all the crappy stereotypical stuff and, you know, put in there more updated uh, research and conclusions. Or, you know, some things which I haven't done, but I'm interested in doing in the future is, you know, maybe volunteering a bit more as scholars to be in conversations with people who develop curricula at the high school uh, level. I also think that, you know, initiatives like social media presence and blogs are a good way to, to generate conversations both within and outside of the field at the same time, right? Because anyone can, you know, anyone can listen to your podcast, anyone can go on blogs or on Twitter. And this can be a, a way to slowly, slowly, shwaya, shwaya, as they say in Egypt, sh change things. And then the, there's obviously, well, the research, you know, what are you working on? How do you engage with post-colonial theory? As professors, of course, many of our interviewees focused on how they could use their roles as teachers to address these problems. From new objectives to new approaches and subjects to a more open discussion of the underpinnings of the fields. Damien, Asa, Dimitri, and Rebecca give examples of how they incorporate these topics into their teaching. Really, over this last year, maybe even during the summer leading up to this fall, just kind of having all these personal realizations and awakenings. And like you said, you know, things that we almost certainly weren't thinking of because of our own kind of privileged position. Being aware of it and then like readdressing, you know, talking about things in a classroom. So I'm teaching first semester Latin. And I'm using Hans Orberg's Lingua Latina series, which is life in a first century Roman household. And so they beat their children and they own slaves. And, you know, they, they talk about relative ugliness and prettiness and things like this. I mean, not to mention the fact that because I'm doing a kind of spoken Latin, it assumes that everyone in my classroom is going to have a gender identity that we can pinpoint together, like a choose a binary gender. And I mean, just in the first weeks of class, like I immediately realized standing in front of my students, like this is way more complicated than I guess I've thought about these things in the past. And my way of dealing with it is to, you know, not, not, not address it, which is to say, I address it, not like, just let it go by. So, you know, talk about the fact that classical Latin, as we have it, is an extremely gendered language, both grammatically, but then it also assumes, you know, a worldview of, you know, biological gender and, and that, you know, this is not ideal for 21st century students to talk about themselves. And for that matter, you know, talking about the, the daily life things that in this textbook that was originally written in the 60s, I guess, by a European man that, you know, like certain things that are kind of played up for humor, like brothers punching sisters and parents beating children and teachers beating children. But these are things that like, we don't need to read it the way that a mid 20th century Danish man wrote it that we can say this is kind of messed up when they're doing this and like you know this character this the, the dominus the lord of the household is not a good person because he's kind to his slaves like it's problematic for a human to uh, own other humans and w it's okay to talk about this uh, and we should talk about it i mean which has actually kind of made the material more fun you know questioning like is he, is he an upright master and you know like i will even suggest i'll be like well you know there is no such thing as a a good owner of other human beings 
but kind of, you know, inviting students to think about it, not the way the book is written, which is from the point of view of the family, but, you know, from the point of view of other characters, especially coming out of this summer and the conference of the International Society of Anglo-Saxonists. So getting ready to teach Old English again, coming right out of that, you know, I was like hyper aware of these issues. So my first day of Old English, I did something new. Usually my first day of Old English is a lot of performative doing Beowulf like in Old English and kind of like wowing them and getting them excited and for the intellectual labor that's going to be coming up. Uh, whereas this semester, my main interest was like acknowledging these types of issues. So instead, I gave them some words and just had them like jot down the first things that came to their mind. So words like medieval and Middle Ages or one of the most important ones was Anglo-Saxon. Like, what does that word mean to you? Because at the conference, one of the presenters pointed out she worked at the Sutton Who tourist site. And one of the most common questions they got in the like comment box that people would drop off after they visited was they did not know what was meant by Anglo-Saxon. It seems that is not a uh, useful term for the general public. So we who study it, you know, this is like a, a time period in a specific place. And so medievalists, you know, like if you study England during these years, you call yourself an Anglo-Saxonist. But it seems when we're addressing a larger public, it doesn't seem even, you know, a British public. They don't think that. They don't think the way we think. So we need to make sure we're using terms that make sense to them. Because the term Anglo-Saxon is often very thinly veiled code for like a particular type of whiteness, both in the United States and in Great Britain. And most of us, I think the vast majority of us, people who teach this material, we don't want to be perceived as promoting. That's not what we mean when we say Anglo-Saxon. So we need to address it and like make sure our students understand we are not talking about that. We are talking about this, but acknowledge that this does exist and is used in these ways, that this other use of it. The first hour of the semester was just spent kind of like unpacking the terms that we use for talking about. And then, you know, once we had talked about it a little bit. I told him explicitly why I was doing this, like because of this use of medieval material for racist purposes, which has no place in my classroom. That's how we started the semester. And if on some chance someone was there because they wanted that, let them know that they will be disappointed and maybe they shouldn't take my class. We do have a an obligation. And I think this is where a bunch of the pushback has come from people in the field. We have an obligation to explain what we mean when we use these terms, and also an obligation to explain to students how these things intersect with our current world now. I have my own kind of idiosyncratic terminology that I use for this, and I, and I realize that this is not how the terms are really used or anything, but this is what I think in my head, is I think about antiquarians and historians, and antiquarian is the term I use to describe people who are interested in the past as a kind of curio, as its own separate little object of fascination, Whereas I think of historians as people who have a kind of binocular vision, one eye on one thing and one eye on the other, always looking at the past with an eye toward the present. Because otherwise, what's the point? Yes, all right, the past was interesting, but it is interesting because we live in the present. And in many ways, we live with the echoes and ghosts and monsters of the past. The other thing I, or I'm doing, you know, it's a small thing, but I think it's a, a useful thing is thinking about how I want to incorporate this into my teaching. So one thing I'm doing next semester is I'm teaching a class that I'm, at the moment anyway, very ill-prepared to teach, but I'm going to do a lot of work to get there on sort of race and ethnicity in the ancient world. So looking at the ways that Greeks and Romans talk about different people, different cultural practices, and, you know, different, the way people look and why do, you know, why people act certain ways, read some some Hippocratic stuff and, you know, read Herodotus and, and, and Tacitus and so on. And then also think about in that class to think a little bit about how the Greeks and the Romans themselves were received into Europe, basically. So the sort of reception of the Greeks and Romans as ethne or whatever peoples, right, into the sort of European story, you know, the European master narrative. And I was inspired to do this because I went, I saw Denise McCoskey give a talk. Denise has a book called, I think it's Race, Antiquity, and Its Legacy or something like that. She gave this great talk that I saw about what it's like to teach 
the stuff. It's, you know, what she works on, the way her students react to it. One of the things she points out, it's kind of, I thought was really interesting was that her students were much more receptive to talk about race in an ancient context because there was a little bit of distance, you know, like in a sociology class where you're talking about race in 21st century America, there can be a kind of reticence for students to talk. If you're looking at another culture, it gives you a little bit of distance. You know, you can relate it to things now, feeling a little bit safer somehow. So I think it's a way to move conversations forward in a very general sense, as I say, in a sense that, you know, embraces sort of modern discussions. But that also points out to students how complex, how like really complex the ancient world was in this regard and how different their ways of thinking about it were, you know? Like, I think one of the things that Denise and others were talking about after her talk was that, you know, our students understand that different cultures have different sexualities, right? That like Greco-Roman sexuality was not the same as modern sexuality, but maybe they're less equipped to think that Greco-Roman, you know, sort of racial categories are equally foreign and different, that's shaped by historical forces and all of that. When I was a grad student and I was like applying for jobs, I thought it'd be fun to teach a class like this, but I don't think I realized what's so interesting about it, you know? And I think some of the, the stuff that's been happening recently has led me to think a bit more critically about the value of, of teaching a class like this. One of the things you realize, though, is that if you teach it using only the sort of well-known tried and true texts, you get a very skewed view of how the ancients understood these concepts of race and ethnicity. And in fact, it's hard to say even whether we can call them race and ethnicity until you really sort of dig in and, and look at things. You can't just teach Herodotus and Hannibal and, and Salus Jugurtha and, and some things. You have, to, you, have, you have to really sort of go off the beaten path and find these places where they live. So that's when I started working on the source book on race and ethnicity, when I discovered that someone I knew, uh, Sidner Roy, was teaching Temple's longstanding race and ethnicity class. I said, hey, do you want to do this source book with me? And so we ended up doing that. And then my spouse, Max Goldman, got looped into it because he was in the office with me one summer while I was trying to translate Argonautica. He, he, we brought him on board to translate a bunch of the Latin stuff. And, and so the source book on race and ethnicity in the ancient world was born. And when it came out in 2013, not a lot of people were teaching the course, but the press had the foresight to see that people might. And, and now, of course, the world has sort of caught up to this idea that this stuff still matters. Well, I mean, obviously, I would say go out and get the source book. Um, <laughs> do it and use the resources that, you know, like I know the medievalists are building this wonderful bibliography online. I've been building the bibliography. I'm putting my syllabi up. Contribute your syllabi if you have them so we can make the make the resources bigger. So I would say start with the resources that are starting to become available. I think that's a, a first step. Right. Secondly, don't be afraid to contact people. If you if you read a blog post or if you read something that people have written, you know, why is it always the haters that contact us? Um, <laughs> if you're actually interested and in, in you see us doing something or you see an article or you see a comment or something, feel free to. We're happy to share the resources that we have available to us and, and the ideas. The second thing I would say is to just read. I always tell students when they're reading ancient sources is that, you know, you need to, to come at it with two perspectives. One is come at it from the perspective of they aren't like they, they are not like us. These are foreigners. These are aliens. They're they're foreign to us. But also at the same time, keep your in the back of your head that they're not unlike us either, <laughs> if that makes sense, because I think it's easier for people to see where the ancient and the modern come together if they can simultaneously recognize that they're both foreign and the same. The same in that they should have prejudices and those prejudices have, have shaped our prejudices simply because of the way that classical education was utilized. I think that's an area that people should really sort of be thinking about is where did classics, how was classics used? I think we as a field need to be more attuned to how classics has been used. Like when we do classical reception, we need to stop thinking about theater productions and we need to start thinking about American education, American science, the use of classics as, a, as a, not just a gatekeeper, but also as, a, as an actual tool for creating the structures of racism in our country and be open to that idea. And then recognizing that there are a lot of things that the ancients do because they are different from us that provide us with 
different ways of thinking about race. There are a lot of texts from antiquity, and this is what I mean by getting off of Tacitus and getting off of just Herodotus and, and exploring into a much broader array of text, which the you know things like my source book and uh, me and Sinner and Max and and then um, other people who are trying to get more translations out there of less mainstream texts is that there are actually alternate views, <laughs> alternate approaches to these ideas of how you structure and how you think about group identities that can actually be really useful in, in helping deconstruct. So having two eyes at all time, one, the complicity of the field, and two, also the way that the actual diversity of the field as it exists, uh, the world that we study existed, can help mitigate that complicity. So I would, I would encourage people to, to just read broadly. Start with the, the source material that's available broadly and, and get out of the 19th century and the early 20th century. If I could say anything to academic publishers, especially of articles and things, I would say, please, the only things that are open access tend to be racist 19th century, early 20th century tripe and bad translations of these texts that are imbued with, the, with those worldviews. Please make things more open access so that we can get access to better, have the material be more accessible to the public. And then I would also say to people in the field itself, be more open to public scholarship if you're working in these areas. You can do public scholarship. I think there are some people out there who are doing public scholarship right now that is not intellectually lacking. This idea that you have to dumb things down for the public is not true. <laughs> you just have to say it differently. So I would say to people in the field, just do it. Engage in these conversations and be willing to learn from people who have done this as their expertise instead of trying to just shut it down. And I think we need to rethink maybe in the field itself how we teach, not just the material that we teach, but how we approach it, uh, whether it's teaching Latin or whether it's teaching Greek history or Roman history or Greek or Roman lit. What texts do we select? What conversations do we open up? How do we structure the themes of our classes? Do we treat women as its own day? And, you know, do we treat race as its own day separate from the sort of everyday life of slaves in the city? Do we only treat it with respect to slaves or do we actually talk about it outside of that dynamic, especially when you think about Rome? And are we explicit in basically saying, and, and do we recognize the difference between race and ethnicity in a contemporary context and race and ethnicity in an ancient context? I think that's one of the, the biggest places that we ourselves, we ourselves need to go and look at other fields and, and those other fields like anthropology and, and fields who are dealing with race theories and race issues, they should come and talk to us as well. It's a two-way street. Dismissing the classical world as, as you know, dead white men is not productive. And the question should actually be asking is how did, how did it become this idea that the ancient world was just a bunch of dead white men? <laughs> it's a much more interesting question than dismissing it. So I teach the big sweeping first half of the Western art survey, problematic scare quotes around Western, etc. But in a process of sort of self-flagellation, uh, each time I teach it, I have a unit right around the middle of the semester where I cover ancient Jewish and early Christian art under Rome. And I started several years ago having this be an essay midterm in the middle of a class that's otherwise exam based. And what it does is it draws out all the latent anti-Semitism in the room. Now, I want to be absolutely clear. The vast majority of my students are good and decent and caring people and do not hold consciously any kind of animus toward Jewish people. I firmly believe that. And yet I will read dozens of essays that contain mild forms, if that's really a thing, of anti-Semitic ideas and misunderstandings and tropes. I see, for example, lots of essays that say, when Judaism became Christianity, when Judaism evolved into Christianity, Jews who follow the teachings of Jesus, who was their Messiah, uh, even mild things like ideas about the Old Testament, which, you know, is a Christian appropriation of Jewish scripture explicitly read against Jewish intent for Christian purposes, right? So Jews do not use the Old Testament. Jews use the Torah or the Tanakh. They use Jewish scripture, the Midrash, call it whatever you want, uh, these various texts they have, you know, but they are not the Old Testament, which is a Christian construct and reuse. So the, why do I do this to myself? Because they're painful to read sometimes. I do it because it's an opportunity. Because otherwise, I don't have a platform to say, 
Hey, everybody. I know you're all wonderful, loving, great people, and I have great affection for you all, and I'm all glad you're here. Here's the ways that you're anti-Semites. And so it's an opportunity to have a conversation with them about it in, I hope, really, I mean, I, I joke about it. I, would, I don't actually call them anti-Semites, but I, I hope it's a, that it's an effective way of raising these issues and saying, all right, so here's some things I noticed in a whole bunch of the papers. People said this, which is problematic for this reason. People said that, which is problematic for that reason. And so it, while it is no fun for me, uh, is an opportunity to take these things a bit head on. And this is something that I am trying to find more ways to do. I mean, I will be perfectly frank. Why is it anti-Semitism that was the thing I've been already doing this with for years? Because I come from a Jewish background. And so I was uh, more sensitized to that, I think, than I was to other forms of subtle bias. I mean, obviously, you know, out and out racism is easy to spot all the time. But I wasn't thinking about, for example, as we were talking about before, you know, the, the resonance of the term Anglo-Saxon, say. Just that wasn't on my radar in the way that the equally subtle uh, use of Old Testament is on my radar and has been for a long time. And so, I mean, I do think one of the lessons of our current moment, one of the necessities, one of the strategies of our current moment is that we all must get out of our own particular identity groups and stand up and show up and speak up for all the marginalized groups, whether or not we have a uh, personal or familial connection to them. It is not enough for, say, a Jewish professor to make sure that his students figure out some of the problematic legacies of medieval anti-Semitism. It is incumbent on the same professor to make sure they also learn about the problematic legacies from the Middle Ages, sexism and homophobia and other forms of racism and other forms of cultural bias and prejudice that permeate the modern world. It's very important that these changes don't only come from those who are affected by the problems. Everyone in the field is implicated, and it's everyone's responsibility to work to make things better, as Asa, Rebecca and Donna emphasize. We, I think, have an obligation to not quote unquote, leave it to, say, medievalists of color to deal with issues of race and leave it to Jewish medievalists to deal with anti-Semitism. And, oh, well, surely I don't have to write about women. There's a female medievalist will write about women. We've all got an obligation to get in the game, not just for our own various intersecting identities, uh, but more broadly. I think that that's the only it's the only way we're going to make progress it's the women in the field who are leading this battle. And I don't think it's a coincidence, but it tends to be, like I said, it's it's the men in the field who tend to still get the recognition for it. And high school teachers too, they're on the front lines. We need to listen to them and give them resources that they can use to to ensure that the diversity of the ancient world is is open to people. You know, as, as my friend who's a Roman historian in our field who she works on migration and immigration and colonialism, she doesn't really care about she said to me, she goes, she's like, I don't care about these d these public debates. Is it bad that I don't because she's she's Indian. And she says, is it bad that I don't? And I said, you know, no, I mean, you do you, you know, you do migration and, and colonialism. That's a different thing. You know, she does the Roman provinces. Uh, and she said, good, because, you know, she goes, I don't want to to feel that as a brown person, I need to do that labor to educate, you know, others. And so I think on the one hand, you know, you want to have representation, but on the other hand, you know, sometimes that labor needs to be done by people, uh, by us. One reason that white classicists and medievalists have a responsibility to speak out is that the backlash against them tends to be less than against people of color or those who can be identified as Jewish or in some other way othered. I've received many pitches about topics related to white supremacy and classics that writers have later withdrawn because they've been you know, too worried about the pushback. And I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that. I've, I've never really had, since I finished my PhD, a chance to teach medieval stu a medieval studies unit or a medievalism unit, but I've done quite a bit in the last five years or so. I've done quite a bit of guest lecturing into medievalism units, um, into some cultural studies units, things like that. And talking about usually, say, a text like Game of Thrones or uh, medieval video games or something like that. And the classroom's always interesting because there's always pushback. So I've I've never had a class where there wasn't at least a few students saying, "No, no, no, you're wrong. The Middle Ages were white, but that's just the way it is. Why are we talking about this?" 
But then you also have the students who are open to ideas and start to see and sort of will come up to you at the end and say, oh, oh now I get it, it's this thing, or oh, it's just like this other thing. So, I mean, to me, the, the classroom, and I've also heard stories from people who have, say, used a blog post of mine or something in a history classroom and said, oh, yeah, there were some people who were really upset by this. You must be doing something right. You know, you can't sort of teach these ideas and you can't question that fundamental belief in the whiteness of the Middle Ages without having pushback. I've certainly never received the kind of terrible abuse and, and harassment that others have. And this is something that I've said before as well. You know, I've never been trolled from anything that I've said or published online. You know, I'm not inactive on Twitter. And so a week or two ago, I did an interview with David Perry and he wrote it up in Pacific Standard um, about these issues. So, and I got, I don't know, four or five people tweeting me about it, but it was, there was nothing abusive in it. I certainly wasn't targeted by anybody. Whereas a medievalist of colour writing and saying the same things or anything similar, there's absolutely no doubt that they would be targeted, harassed, trolled, doxxed. A couple of years ago, I did a, a conference panel with Dorothy Kim and Jonathan and a few other people. And two of us on the panel talked about teaching race in the classroom. We were both white and Dorothy got trolled as a result of it, but neither of us did. And I thought that was a fairly good encapsulation of what the situation is like as a white medievalist talking about race, that it's, it's, a, it's a much safer thing for me to do than it is for a person of colour. Of course, as, as, a, as a white person, and, and interestingly, right, so I've written stuff for Adelon in the popular context that is not necessarily nice to white supremacists. I've been sort of blogging about them and all sorts of things, but uh, I haven't gotten a lot of the public pushback that you see from others. And it's an interesting thing. In part, I had avoided Twitter for a very long time. And I think that was one thing. And when I did join Twitter, I imported from a friend of mine who's a Holocaust scholar, um, her block list, which is over 110,000 people strong. So I had already sort of weeded out some of the elements <laughs> earlier. But I, I think there's something to be said for the fact that unlike Donna and unlike Sarah, I don't have any recognizably overt ties to, to being Jewish. The anti-Semitism that seems to accompany talking about race and ethnicity in the ancient world as, as on a platform, I don't think that it's not a coincidence. You know, of course, they don't know that I'm married to a Jew, but you know, whatever. But I've got this Kennedy name <laughs> that... Um, from my previous marriage that sort of shields me in some ways. And then my middle name is Eastern European. So I've got, I've got sort of some, some protections built in because I found it was really interesting when I was looking at and tracking particularly where the We Condone It By Our Silence article went. I was not the person who was being bashed. Donna was for publishing it, not me for writing it. So I think there's something to be said that that I've, I've been able to be somewhat insulated simply because they're not, sh other than the fact that I'm a woman, maybe some of them don't know how to get at me at, in the easiest manner. So, so I think there's a benefit there. Secondly, in terms of, uh, I would say in terms of teaching, one of the things that I find really interesting is that I have a really great response from the students. I have the 10 years now that I've been teaching this class. I, I had one student who was like, said racist things in class. And other students like, noticed my facial expressions as they happened. And so people felt like I, you know, it was okay that I wasn't going to let it slide by. But I've never had any issues on campus with my students or any of the students here thinking that I'm some sort of, you know, lefty lunatic indoctrinator. So that's been nice. In fact, my class always has wait lists that are as long as the actual class roster. And I always have to over-enroll the class whenever I teach it. I think part of that is we just have a, com a campus culture where students are open to these things. It's a small liberal arts college, right? It's not a big state school. But we've had our own issues here with race. And, you know, the, the campus response to an incident that we had about 10 years ago to um, some explicit racism on campus was, well, everybody needs to learn more about racism. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was a student-led initiative. It, it was not top-down. I think the other thing, too, in terms of my personal experience of working on the material, I've sort of backdoored a lot of scholarship. If I had been trying to get some of the stuff that I've published on this material through more traditional routes, I don't know if it would have worked. So 2015, I, I published, along with my colleague Molly Jones-Lewis, um, a handbook to identity in the environment um, in classical and medieval worlds. 
And it's on race and ethnicity in the ancient world and environmental determinism theory as they sort of go from antiquity through the medieval world. And so so environmental determinism, right? It's uh, geography, topography, climate, um, and how they impact physiology and character. And this theory first it, it appears in, in that sort of really explicit form in the Hippocratic Airs Waters places in the fifth century, but it runs well through the, the early 20th century. I mean, Jared Diamond sort of is the contemporary carrier of that torch still today, but it is explicitly in a part of American race science and sort of underscores a lot of American racism, but most people don't realize that. But it runs through medieval medicine, it runs through the Arab scholars, Jewish texts, Chinese texts from antiquity in the medieval world, and, and it's all over the ancient sources. So I, I decided I wanted to do this this book back in like 2011, and I, I managed to get an editor at Rutledge to think it was a good idea. So that came out in 2015, and, and it's it's quiet. You know, a lot of people don't know because it doesn't have the title, it doesn't have the word race in it or ethnicity. And so people don't realize until they open it up what it's actually about. And it hasn't sort of created the kind of backlash. And so in some ways, I, I'm sad that I didn't just lay it out there. But on the other hand, would it have gotten picked up if I had talked about it in terms of race instead of in terms of identity? It's interesting work, but it's not traditional work. And so sending it through a traditional, trying to send the chapter that I wrote for that volume through a traditional journal peer review process would have resulted in epic fail, I think. And I think one of the things you'll notice is that some people like Denise McCoskey and others who have published a lot earlier in the 90s on race in the field, it's not in our standard journals typically. She was having to put it into not classics journals, whether they were more modern languages, political science or, or education. She often had to go outside of the sort of mainstream classics journals to get things published. So I've been strategic a bit about that because there is a lot of gatekeeping that goes on. And if you want to get this stuff out there and then once it's out there, people start to, you know, if the book is there, when you go to decide, I think I want to teach race and ethnicity. And then you go and you find there's a source book there, <laughs> right? It's like, it makes it a little easier for you. And that's why I started putting my syllabi online and I have other people who who are going to be sending me their syllabi so I can build this database of syllabi that people can look at if they want to get started in doing it. A key issue at the institutional levels is that this sort of work, public-facing scholarship, tends not to be valued by those who decide on hiring, tenure, and promotion. This problem was highlighted repeatedly. Whenever you, you have a certain level of comfort that allows you to take certain position or to say, you know what, I'm going to spend a bit more time this year on doing things that won't count for as many points in my performance report at the end of the year, but that might for me, give me more points in terms of my sense of actually doing something meaningful with my knowledge, then I think, you know, those of us who are in a position to take these decisions should do it. And that's what I'm trying to do. Obviously, this won't give you as much praise in your yearly uh, performance bulletin, you know, that she write blog posts that are not refereed or that she will, I don't know, give a free public lecture at your local uh, public library. But it, it might still, you know, have very tangible impact on your communities. And this is not something we should look down upon, you know, as scholars. I think it is important to try to engage in more concrete conversations with people within the field, but also outside the field, like to, to tear down this, this really imaginary wall. That, that is also a certain wall that is used by people who want to, you know, undermine the use of academia in general and of the humanities and social science in particular, right? Where being increasingly, again, portrayed as an elite who does just master battery work and doesn't really care about the masses for whatever it means. Well, I don't think this is the case, but perhaps, you know, we ought it to ourselves to make it even clearer, not, not so much in reaction to, 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 to such stigmatizing uh, rhetoric, but more in terms of actually building community and doing something with our knowledge that, that benefits or making it accessible to more people. As a field, if we want people to to understand better what it is that we do, we have to make the materials accessible to them. And and I think this came up actually with the conversation about about the new translation of the Odyssey. This idea that who translates things matters, <laughs> but also do you get credit for translating? You don't get credit for it. 
Yes, it's very challenging because especially for for earlier career scholars, you know, late late stage graduate students, postdocs, you know, people on the tender track. I think that those kinds of scholars have a great potential to make an impact when writing for the public, but they also have the most, you know, at stake and in terms of the most to lose. And increasingly I am hearing that an interest in public facing work is viewed positively by search communities, but not too much of an interest. Because if it's too much of an interest, then you may not be sufficiently dedicated to your peer-reviewed work. Just enough. You know, the, the kind of interest the kind of interest where you might appear on a podcast, you know, or write for Eidolon, but not the kind of interest where you would, you know, produce it. And and I think that fixing that that particular outlook will have to be part of a bigger solution as well. But I've been asked many times, you know, where where should I put this on my CV? And I mean, what do I say? service <laughs> somewhere somewhere at the, usually i tell them at the very bottom of their publications you know books come first and then edited volumes and then peer review scholarship blah, blah, blah. put it somewhere below with the book reviews you know i think this is a great idea that i have not yet done but i'm tossing this out to you and to anybody else who might be listening every time we do a substantial project every time we do a book or a series of articles or even just a, a you know a good hefty article that has something to say to our own modern world, culture, politics moment, and I would hope that pretty much everything we're doing does have something to say to our current moment, we should find a way to spin out of it a more public-facing short publication. We should find a way to try and publish brief pieces, op-eds, blog posts, something that would take the work that we're doing and writing for our 12 friends, and push it out to a larger non-specialist audience. And there have been some great examples of this. Send a piece to the New York Times about how, uh, there's been some wonderful work recently on medievalism and white supremacy. I would note the Public Medievalist website is fantastic, doing exceptional public scholarship. Public scholarship should be part of our portfolio from the start. And those of us who are in uh, positions of some authority within the field. So that's people who oversee, who do hires, who oversee tenure and promotion applications, things like that. Talking about people like me should also consciously welcome and recognize that work from people entering the field and making their way up through the ranks so that they realize that that will be recognized as valuable work when they're putting together the job applications and their tenure portfolios and so on. I had already, because I'd been in the field for so many years before I got this job, I, I actually had, had published a monograph before I got here. And then I published a second one before I went up for tenure, but I also had done the source book. And my provost, you know, in the conversation about my tenure, they're like, well, of course, you know, everyone was like all over the immigrant women book and blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, they said it's wonderful. Um, they, you know, it was mixed about the, the source book on whether, you know, whether that's scholarship. And I was like, you know what? You try reading a thousand years worth of literature <laughs> to find the actual relevant sources to do this work and tell me that's not scholarship. You know, I, I, I've been thinking, how can people believe all this crap about, you know, the, the, the classical roots of white supremacy and all these claims they're making about a certain whiteness of the ancient world? And, well, on the one hand, most people do not have a degree, be it undergraduate or graduate, in classics or in ancient history. So the most they've had is maybe one or two high school history class where the ancient world was presented and what they see in mainstream media and on Discovery Channel. And then if very few scholars actually spend the time to do this type of engagement in, you know, broader conversation, then who are we letting the ground to? And then holding ourselves to a higher standard when we on in our public facing work for articulating the value of our field. That this particular part of my, my answer to the solution to the problem is the one that I get the most pushback for uniformly. But I believe that we can do better than this is the foundation of Western civilization. That is so often, I think, what, what we fall back on in, when trying to articulate our value. And to some extent, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic. The value of what we do is so often under fire 
And it feels like an attractive answer. But hopefully the pitfalls of that answer are becoming more obvious. And, and I'm hopeful that, that, that at least a few of the people who, when I initially wrote that last November, the people who, who lashed out, I'm hopeful that some of those people heard Trump's speech in Warsaw in, was it June or July, where he was talking about how, you know, Western civilization's gifts to the world and thought, huh, you know, there maybe really is something white supremacist about this. So many of the articles we publish at Eidolon are a little bit comparative between, you know, something in ancient Greece or Rome and, and something in the present day. And it's really tempting to make, to, to have the title or, or the, the sort of tagline for the article be something about, you know, the, the ancient roots of Twitter or whatever. But we really, really try not to fall back on any kind of roots or foundation narrative because I, I do think it's very limiting. It's, it's much more interesting and productive in my mind to sort of put the two things next to each other and, and see what happens when you look at them alongside each other than, than just sort of have to look at it as that the ancient is at the foundation of everything. So should scholars be trying to respond to incorrect and hateful uses and misuses of the past by people on the internet, in public and elsewhere? And if so, how? Okay, I think there's limited value in corrective responses to white extremist views of the Middle Ages. The, re the reality is that the kind of social media interactions where somebody, you know, posts something ridiculously anachronistic and then we say, no, no, that's wrong. You know, on one level, you're never going to convince the person who has the extremist view or it's, it's very difficult and you're not likely to do it, you know, through a Twitter exchange. But I do think it's very valuable and very important to provide that counter narrative because the people that you're speaking to on social media are never just the person that you're tweeting back to. You know, you're also being read, hopefully, by people who haven't already made up their mind. You're always speaking as well to the movable middle, to the people who, if they only ever see one version of the Middle Ages as, you know, if, they only, if people only ever see the white supremacist version of the Middle Ages, then they have no other idea. They can't challenge that idea. They don't even recognise that it can be challenged. So I do think it's very important to publicly work against that view of the Middle Ages. I think it's important to do it in social media, to do it in regular media. I think it's important to do it in the classroom and to think about how your research might be able to challenge that view. I think it's also important to not just be reactive, so to not wait until there's something terrible to argue against, but also to provide something that, as much as one can, to present medieval studies and the Middle Ages as a space that is not whites only in a proactive way. And I do think that speaking to those people and presenting them with a view that does counter what's still a dominant perspective on the Middle Ages is, is really important and really potentially useful. And I do think it helps when there are more classicist voices doing that in public. So we can't, I mean, what Mary Beard is doing is incredible. And, and I, I cannot believe the awful stuff that she's getting for it. But, you know, Mary Beard can't, can't solve that, all, that for all of us. So that's, that is part, part of it is, is to have more voices speaking up and doing what she's doing and, and working to combat those narratives. And then there's that large, uh, hopefully large, potentially convincible audience we could reach who might be susceptible to alt-right classics, but also might be interested to hear what professional classicists think that you know ancient Rome and Greece and Roman Britain looked like and so presenting our work in a way that is accessible and and vital and relevant there's a strong tendency a strong desire and i am definitely guilty of this to want to just rail about these things scream about how awful they are and how terrifying they are but we have to I think also speak in a way that doesn't demonize people sitting in the room with us uh, if we can manage it. I'm not, this is very hard for me. It's very troubling to think about. But if we can always proceed to start from a place of compassion, and that's their flaw, right? Is failing to do that. If we can manage that. And again, I'm not saying I live up to this goal all the time. I'm not saying that it's easy or necessarily universally possible. But if we can start from a place of compassion, I think we have a much greater chance 
of reaching even the furthest out on the spectrum. But you can see it in students' eyes. You know, as I walk around my classroom, I tend to be pretty uh, jittery and mobile, you know, and as I'm walking around, even the big class got 100 people in the room and talking about these issues, and you can see it right in people's eyes, how much you need to talk about these things, how much they need to hear them, how appreciative often they are of the fact that this conversation is even happening in a place where they didn't anticipate it. And on that, one point I would make is, you know, we've got women and gender studies classes. We've got gender and sexuality studies classes. We've got, you know, African or Africana studies classes. You know, we've got critical race studies classes in all of our universities, all this stuff. We've got Jewish studies classes. We've got classes on Islam, right? We have all these things, right? But the people who are in those classes aren't the ones who we most necessarily need to reach. And so what we need to be doing is deploying whatever it is we do to get these messages across. There is an enormous opportunity in teaching a general education class to 120 students. That class consists of engineers and biologists and business majors and kinesiologists and, oh, two art historians in the front row. And so I, I've decided not to waste it. Everything that we've all three of us been talking about, about teaching, also applies to research. So if we're going to write a book, let's say, let's just say for the sake of argument that someone were to write a book about, say, maps and monsters in medieval England, at random, off the top of my head. Um, now, that might be a book that does deal with issues of race and actually gets it wrong a few places here and there. But let's say you wrote that whole book and never really engaged with whether or not there were women alive in the Middle Ages. That might be a severely missed opportunity as well as a kind of conceptual flaw. For those not uh, familiar, yeah, that that was my first book and it came out of my dissertation. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of it. And also there are things that are wrong with it. But so I think the same thing, of course, not every article in every book can be about literally everything. The question should always be present as we're thinking about how we're framing our work. Are we, without thinking about it, leaving out whole swaths of the human beings who were looking at, making, seeing, receiving, paying for all of this stuff? Are we not cognizant of that? Are we not thinking about the way that things like race or religion are constructed in the images that we're talking about? I'm not saying every article that anybody writes now has to be about race and gender and sex and class and so on. But I'm saying I really do think we have to think about it literally every time we write. We have to ask ourselves the question, is that somehow relevant? Am I leaving out a portion of this story by not considering it? Does it have a place in this? Can I work it in? And the answer shouldn't be I don't have room for it or, oh, it's not really what I do. I really work on something else or, oh, I'm not informed enough. But all the people, you know, that that we would be talking about writing academic books all have all of the skills necessary to learn how to talk about these things. Right. Um, So it's a question of where do I want to dedicate my time? And I would say we should be dedicating our time to this as a key thing. I remember that I have read a German article by a professor who was trying to defend the position of a virology and say that it is important for the ancient history. And he was writing online, but for a very local and very specific audience, saying that papyrology is very important for the ancient history of Europe. And papyri is historical documents that is very important, either the documentary or the the literature, the Greek literature is important for our ancient history. So I approached him and told him that if you are talking about the importance of papyrology and online, you have to take into account that I could treat you and I am an Egyptian and I have studied in Germany, I know German, and ancient history is our history. It's the history of humanity, not just the history of Europeans or Muslims, you know, or Arabs, you know. It's ancient history is the history of all humanities. There is connections there. So don't say that it is exclusively European. It is our uh, ancient history as well as others' ancient history, you know. The, the world it is now is, you know, a small village 
And I think the idea has been there even in antiquity, you know, uh, during the Roman Empire, the idea that the whole world is just one polis, just one city uh, governed by the Roman Empire. Now we are becoming more and more one small village. So, even though the internet can feel like the cause of the problem sometimes, it also provides many of the possible solutions. A source of community, a vector of information, a platform for sources that truly do make our disciplines more accessible. I think it is uh, now, that we do have a lot of advancement in this regard, especially with the advancement of digital culture. From speaking from an experience, I I have to say that my colleagues, whenever there is a project, and I will, I told them that there are students in Egypt who are studying Greek and Latin history, or Greek and Latin literature, or reading it in Arabic, and please try to localize your website or localize this or that. They tell me that okay, go ahead, please, and give us what you want, and they uh, upload it. In this regard, for example, there is the project of the Fachforte Buch uh, of Brazica, which is a technical dictionary of the technical terms in Greek papyri, which is in Leipzig, for example. And in the print culture, in its printed version, you will have it in German. But now it is, thanks to the digital shift, we do have this dictionary online with translation of Olimata into German, French, Italian, Spanish, and of course English, and uh, as well as in Arabic. I am the responsible of the Arabic translation of the Limata, which is something that I think will facilitate the study of the, of all the students in Egypt. In papyra.unfo also I have been uh, cooperating with the colleagues in order to have some Arabic translations of the Greek papyra there, and so on. I think I think this project, I think this, this project is important in this regard. I mean, the digital aspect, when you go digital, you should be thinking of a global audience, not just in Europe or in, in America or Australia. You will be seen here also in the Arabic world. So try to localize it, try to have an interface in Arabic. The people are eager, the youth are eager to learn about their history. I think the, the 25th uh, of the New Year revolution in Egypt has shown to the world that, that there are a lot of youth who are using the internet and using it effectively to know about their past and their present and to speculate about the future. And as an Egyptian who is living uh, in Egypt, I can say that this is still the same. They still face the same problem. They still same, face the same uh, challenges. And they are searching the internet for solution. They are trying to go away from this ideological view of, of the state or about the past, you know, the, the, the narrative, the governmental or, you know, the dominant narrative about the past. They are trying to find their own way. And I think the digital culture in this regard could do something, you know, by your broadcasters, by blogging about it uh, in English or in Arabic, you know, that will be great. So the direction should be in this, that there is audience in this region who is eager to know, and we should address this audience, not, not just the audience where we publish the book or uh, do our work. And I was just in a conference in Trier, which is called the Modern Arabic Scholarship on the Medieval and Ancient World. And uh, it's actually a good initiative because we will build a database of all the bibliography, the modern Arabic bibliography in ancient world, in papyrology, in archaeology, in literature, in Arabic, you know, with transliteration into English and a summary. And this database will be updated regularly. And I will uh, write a reference work about the classical studies in the Arab world. So I think this is... This is something that will give a chance to anyone who is eager to know about this 
to read it, it will be in English. And I think this is something, this is a progress, you know, uh, to recognize Arabic, to, to, to recognize the living tradition of Arabic, modern Arabic scholarship in classics. As many people in all over the world recognize the classical Arabic tradition, I mean the, uh, the Greek translation movement under the Abbasid, you know, you will have a lot of scholarship in this. But for the living tradition in classics, you will have almost none, you know, just a few small articles about what is happening here in Egypt, you know, but no comprehensive study of this. And the living tradition is entirely neglected. The people are producing articles and scholarship. And actually, this is very important scholarship because the Arabic audience are, as we have seen, you know, responsible of or living around archaeological sites, very important archaeological site. If these people don't appreciate these archaeological sites, uh, we would be seeing something like, like what we have seen in the, in the last uh, uh, years, you know, by destruction of these archaeological sites and anything like this, because they don't, you don't believe that these things belong to us, you know. Uh, see, these things as uh, belongs to other people, I think, uh, is very dangerous in itself, you know, because it does not belong to us, so we will destroy it or neglect it. Not our heritage, but actually it is. It is our heritage here. You know, It's not uh, a view that's shared by a lot of people here in, in the Arabic, uh, in Egypt and the, Arab, and the Arab world, but at least this is my view and, you know, Greek and Latin, Egyptian, uh, any other culture that has been here in, in Egypt is our heritage, is our past, you know. So why not? Why not to have a scholarship, an Arabic scholarship? And, and actually Arabic is important uh, in, in this regard because those people read uh, mostly Arabic, you know. To produce the scholarship in just German, English, French and Italian will not be accessible to these people. And I think the, the print culture is, you know, these are the, the, the most venerated languages of classical studies, you know, as I noted in my studies, you know, so e either in English, German, uh, French, Italian, but uh, very few scholarship in Arabic. I have started this blog, which is Classics in Arabic, and I try to aggregate the news about classical uh, scholarship and uh, Arabic readership in classics, you know, in English. And I have discovered day after the other that we uh, have started uh, a translation movement of the literature, of the Greek and Latin literature, you know, and uh, beginning from the 19th century. And we have actually translated uh, most of the Greek drama, you know, the main three dramatists, you know, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, into Arabic, you know. So why is this? And, and it has been performed, you know, in the National Theatre of Egypt. Uh, and it is viewed, and it has been broadcasted in the radio, and most of the people know about it, you know. So why it is exclusively? I mean, so... The, so I, I began to go on further and dig deeper and deeper. I began to realize that uh, this has not to do with the view of the Arabs themselves, you know, to this heritage, but has to do with the modern history of, you know, of the region, the modern history in which we are living now. It's uh, a view that has been imposed in Egypt and its modern history. You could go to Donald Reed book, uh, about whose pharaohs, you know, and you will see how Krumers has used the classics, uh, has used the Greek and Roman past for his ideological purposes, you know, in order to control these people and to uh, subjugate these people. You know. Our interviewees had a variety of suggestions and stories about their own experiences that may help point our way forward through these difficult issues. I found that one of the if not solutions, but things that we need to be doing is just where opportunities present themselves. They, or I think opportunities are all over the place. If you are aware of it, uh, just introduce this. Allow your students to see, like, yes, this old material can be problematic in this in these ways, and we should talk about it. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's allowed to do X or Y or make these various assertions. We can object to it. 
the other issue related to this is if we are going to talk about these things, you know, we need to be careful and aware of what we're doing, of, you know, the types of material we're throwing out there. I hope that we are all sensitive to our, you know, students, you know, own experiences, what they might bring to the texts. But especially if we're going to want to address issues like racism and, you know, sexual violence, that we do so thoughtfully and carefully. I taught a class at Toronto about trying to introduce our students to research. So, you know, the sort of telling, teaching them how to write a research paper and you know, sort of, I think, method and theory is, I think the name of the class is developed by a friend of mine, Ben Agrig. And for under, for all of our undergraduate majors to sort of help them once they got to these upper level seminars to sort of realize, you know, okay, you're not in a lecture anymore. You know, you have to write a research paper and yeah. And so one of the things I was trying to, you know, tell them about in that class was the kinds of research that classicists do, you know, that we don't just sit around reading, you know, some of us may do this, but most of us don't just sit around reading like Livy and, you know, Thucydides all day that, you know, we're engaged in other kinds of research endeavors that, you know, that, that, that the field is really active and, and, and dynamic. And so one of the things I talked about was the Archimedes palimpsest. Because, I, you know, I did this whole thing about, like, how do we have our texts? Where do we get our texts from? You know, we've got manuscripts, we've got papyri, we've got these um, these palimpsestic texts. You know, it's an interesting example because there's a Byzantine prayer book written in Jerusalem making use of older texts that include, a you know, manuscript of Archimedes. It's then purchased by some wealthy patron, maybe Jeff Bezos, I think is the rumor, and then gifted to the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, which then takes apart the Byzantine prayer book so that they can subject it to all these different, you know, scientific texts so that they can read the text of Archimedes underneath. And it's a, it's a great example of, you know, sort of scientific analysis helping us to discover new texts and the students love it for that reason. But, you know, there's also an ethical question, which is that, is it really ethical? I mean, you know, the, the Orthodox Church in, of Jerusalem tried to block the sale, and a judge in New York said, no, 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 the sale is legal, it can go forward. But, you know, I was telling my students, I hope that if you found a Byzantine prayer book, the first thing you wouldn't do is rip it apart, you know, to find some ancient text underneath. You know, not to say that the Walters was doing something unethical, but the Byzantine prayer book has value in its own right, right? It's its own sort of cultural artifact. Yeah. And, you know, you think about the fact that there used to be a Greek village on top of ancient Delphi that was moved or the way that there are inscriptions built into modern Greek churches. And like, you know, what do you do? Do you rip those churches apart so that you can find the, you know, va super valuable inscriptions? Well, like, I think most of us would say, no, you don't do that. Right. But there was a time when people were much more willing to, to do just that. What's the value of an 18th century church compared to, you know, the inscriptions we might find? So, you know, that's, that's one way that, that something gets prioritized. It's funny, you know, for all of us, so much of our world is really like a post-World War II phenomenon. And it's so easy to take it for granted. You know, when I talk to other Greek Americans or Greek Canadians about the way Greeks were received in North America 100 years ago, some of them find it really hard to believe. And it is hard to believe, right? Because like, I remember as a kid, yeah, I was in high school, we watched this um, this video about racism. Um, I think it was Bill Cosby, actually. And Bill Cosby turns into like a bigot against all these different groups. And at one point, he starts making fun of Greeks. And everyone laughed, you know, because it was kind of ridiculous. You know, no one ever said to me like, oh, you know, you're a damn Greek or something like that. But that wasn't the case for for Greeks that came to Canada or the U.S., you know, not too long ago. So it's and so it's really hard, I think, for people to for all of us to to realize the sort of the way in which the world we live in now is it's really young. It's really new. Um, it's really different from the world that our you know, our grandparents were born into. I think disciplinary silos have something to do with the sort of failures of medieval studies to do better in that many, many people who work in the field have never encountered any of the sort of theory that, that might have led them to think differently or to look at their discipline differently. You know, my PhD was in post-colonial theory and Middle English romance. And the only reason that happened was that I went to a unit for undergraduate. I went to um, the University of Wollongong, which really taught very little medieval studies. There was one Chaucer course and then about halfway through my degree, Louise d'Arson came there and started teaching medieval studies and medievalism. 
But so all my undergraduate training was in post-colonial literature. And then when I encountered these medieval texts, I started sort of seeing similar kinds of things in the literature. But then when I came to my PhD, I had this not highly developed, but I had a body of post-colonial theory that was informing my thinking and always has. Whereas, you know, for many people who study medieval studies right through an undergraduate degree, certainly in the late 90s, would never have encountered that sort of theory or would have only done so in passing. And I think there's certainly a lot of PhD programs and undergraduate programs are changing that now, but, you know, it it takes time for the discipline to change. And, I mean, again, the case of Beowulf, which maybe I know better than a lot of medieval texts, we don't have a lot to go on when it comes to studying Beowulf. We have this one copy of the text. There are no variant versions of it, and there's no explicit sources that we can say unambiguously, this is what the Beowulf poet was manipulating to create this text. But at the same time, since the beginning of Beowulf scholarship, scholars have kind of picked and choosed which elements of the poem as we have it are considered the elements like worth celebrating. It's always the the parody version that most of my students, if they come into my class having studied Beowulf at all, like in high school, is like, this is a great epic pre-Christian poem that has been messed up after the fact by some Christian. So if you ignore all the Christian parts of this poem, you will find a good Germanic poem. And I mean, I don't know if I'm successful, no matter how much I stress that like we cannot make this argument. This is a very problematic argument to make based on the evidence because we only have one version of this poem and it is imbued with these Christian elements. But yeah, that's kind of what you know fantasy writers or even scholars do when they kind of pick and choose what elements of the poem they think are the true poem. And one of the things that people will concentrate on is like, well, you know, it's uh, there's a manly poem in some way. This is a poem about men doing deeds. And in doing that, they then erase half of the characters in the poem. Right now, I am teaching Old English and I'm focusing a lot on Beowulf and the Beowulf manuscript in a way that I'd never done before for the a semester long Old English class. And at the same time, I'm rereading The Hobbit with my daughter. And now we've started Lord of the Rings with my daughter. So I'm I'm thinking about kind of medievalism and fantasy and Beowulf and the other texts contained with Beowulf more deeply than I have maybe ever before. And then, you know, in the background is, you know, this current political situation. So even apart from the the racial issue, I've been thinking of the, the lack of gender diversity in Tolkien's works and especially The Hobbit. And I never even saw The Hobbit movies. I saw the first one and I was kind of so disappointed I never saw anymore. (laughs) But you know, the notion they had to create maybe one or more female characters. And then the implied argument against it is like, well, you know, this is coming from a time period when, you know, women, whatever, were not involved in these types of things in adventures to find gold or whatever. Therefore, it makes sense that Tolkien chose to have, you know, an all male cast of characters. But that again is an absurd argument because on the one hand, as people who study the Middle Ages or classical times, we have all kinds of both female writers and female characters showing up in our literature. And for a text a text like Hobbit and Lord of the Rings reading it alongside Beowulf. Beowulf, the poem, which Tolkien knew inside and out, has six or eight, a number of named female characters uh, who, when I read it with my students, like I, I struck every single time how central kind of their perception of the events in the poem of Beowulf are. This is how I read Beowulf. And, you know, it means a lot more, I find, to my students than a lot of students come into it thinking it's going to be, you know, this warrior smashing kind of stereotypically masculine in some kind of way when the poem is actually like fundamentally sad in a lot of ways and it's the sadness is highlighted by these female characters but Tolkien when he read Beowulf he read it through different lenses and he read it in the early 20th century and the fantasy world he created out of Beowulf is very different from the fantasy world say you know I may have created out of Beowulf But there's nothing inherent in reading Beowulf that necessarily would imply the type of fantasy world that Tolkien created. You know, so if you say you're going to make fantasy literature in 2017 and you're going to have like a wealth of diversity, like sexual diversity and racial diversity and all kinds of diversity. 
And if someone says, well, you're really reflecting your own 2017 cultures and beliefs, I think the answer to that is, yeah. And what's the problem with that? Because that's exactly what Tolkien was doing. And, you know, that's what very, you know, when medieval people retell medieval stories, you know, their stories are a mix of older material, but it's clearly being shaped by, you know, the worldviews and the, the preconceptions of the teller of the story. These other concerns need to be integrated into what we're doing from the ground up as a baseline feature of our teaching. So I'm teaching this semester, my, I'm, I'm the chair of the department now, so I'm only teaching one class per semester while I'm doing that. So I'm teaching this big intro survey. And while in some of my upper division courses, all these themes have already been pretty prevalent. I'm, you know, I teach next semester, I'm teaching my course on the history of monstrosity. And this is what it's all about, you know, one way or another. But in my intro survey, it never really was. I, I kind of left there. Oh, we'll get to you know, the, the, the sort of old model is, you, you know, you teach them the lovely story of Columbus in third grade. And then they get to college and they say, OK, and also genocide. You know, so why are we giving them the sort of bogus narrative to start and then correcting it later? And the same is true, I would say, with our cat. I have 120 students in my intro class. I will have 20 in my medieval class. I will have 20 in my monster class. So most of those students will not go on and get that. So, all right, what do I cover in that class now? 40,000 years of art, you know, that starts with the woman from Villendorf. And you know what? The woman from Villendorf is a great place to start the discussion of racism because all the textbooks still call her the Venus of Villendorf, a name that she picked up because the French guy who was there when they found her was obsessed with Sarki Bartman the so-called Venus Hottentot, who was a San woman who was paraded around Europe in freak shows and named Venus in that kind of ironic mocking way, the way that, you know, you call a giant guy tiny. And so when she was termed Venus, it was a way of highlighting the way that she was considered to be hideous by the racist societies in which she was, uh, through which she was transported. And so when this guy, P.A., looked at the woman from Villendorf, he thought she looked like Sarki Bartman and named her after her. And so she's not named as the textbooks falsely claim uh, because she does seem to be some kind of fertility goddess or fertility idol of some kind that she, you know, therefore is being associated with Venus, the god of, you know, sexuality and love and all of that. That's not who she's named after. She's named after this uh, woman who was paraded in freak shows. And I should know, I mean, it's a complicated story. She had some agency, uh, an organization sued for her kind of release from her manager. And she took the stand and said, I'm making good money. Leave me alone. I don't want to be quote unquote released. You know, you know, her story is complex, fascinating. But when she died, this guy, PA, attempted to buy her preserved genitals. OK, that's the guy who named her so-called Venus of Villendorf. Is that a guy we want to let name our works? Do we want to pass on his viewpoints tacitly by using these terms? And so that's where I start the class now. So what's the cost? All right, this semester, that I've used for a couple of years because I, when I read a book about this, I found it fascinating and horrifying. But this semester, I've been working really hard to integrate this material straight throughout the course at every stage in each unit that we're dealing with. And there's a trade-off, right? Because the, the great, I'm, I'm, I'm sure... You and everybody who has ever taught any subject knows that the great challenge in teaching is the debate between depth and coverage, right? About 40,000 years of history, I'm covering, you know, in theory, it used to be considered, you know, sort of European history, but really it's the entire Mediterranean basin. It is North African stuff, Middle Eastern stuff, as well as European stuff. That is a gargantuan amount of material to cruise through. And so anything that I say in that class that is not information, historical context, visual analysis about works of art from exactly those traditions that are in there, all of that material is actually taking time away from the other stuff. And that, I think, is, again, where some of that pushback you were, you were referring to comes from. That said, again, got to ask ourselves, what's the important thing here? What are we really doing? What's the point? What are we trying to accomplish the vast majority of students taking that class are not going to come away from it expert in the intricacies of Etruscan art. That can't be its purpose, because if they don't follow up on it, if it is the first and last class they're going to take in this subject, 
that data is not going to be the thing that is cemented in them so that 20 years from now, they find themselves saying, well, of course, the Romans made extensive use of the bronze casting abilities of the Etruscans once they've conquered them. Like, that's not going to happen. So if that's the function of the class, it's just not going to succeed long term. So instead, if part of the function of this class can be revealing to students some of the problematic history that is both, and by that I mean both the history of the periods we're discussing and the historiography of the subjects we're teaching, that is so much more valuable, I think, than making sure that I get to the last image in each of my PowerPoints. Now, consequently, I'm not getting to the last image in any of my PowerPoints this semester. (laughs) Uh, And I feel a little bit badly about that. On the other hand, we are having really rich and I think meaningful discussions. And I've had students come up to me after class, come to my office hours to express that it means a lot to them to hear these discussions, to have these conversations in these contexts. Johns Hopkins asked me to write a book on this based on my Adelon material. It's a frightening moment, but I think it's an important moment for us that this issue of race and ethnicity as it's represented in the ancient world versus how white our field is, <laughs> why that there might be some some connection between that, and even just thinking about liberal arts education itself and how that contributes to to the whiteness of higher ed, generally speaking. I mean, I was very fortunate when I was a I was a an adjunct and visitor at George Washington University for three years. And I worked with Eric Klein there, biblical archaeologist. He's huge uh, on public outreach. Like he does stuff with National Geographic. He's gotten more outreach awards than in the AIA than anybody. And he always said, you know, especially in the area of biblical archaeology, when you cede that territory to cranks and non-specialists, you set yourself up within the academy to, to fail. You set the field up to diminish expertise, to diminish the work that we do. And I think that's the problem. And that diminishment of public scholarship is, is sort of rampant. Then we shouldn't be surprised when white supremacists are running around carrying shields <laughs> with Spartan emblems on them because we're letting you know non-experts and video game makers and other people just dictate and decide what the ancient world looks like to the public. If we say, you know, that the Middle Ages, this period that I'm going to stand up here and praise a whole lot for the brilliant manuscripts and works of architecture and so on that they were making, has been used powerfully by white supremacists to advance their hate-filled agenda, it matters to the students from all backgrounds and perspectives, the people who will hear their own fears and concerns and the dangers that really do exist in their world, recognized, heard, seen by, you know, the bald guy with a beard and a PhD who stands at the front of the classroom and looks like Mr. Professor Guy, you know? That matters enormously, I think, to them. And I think it also, though, matters, I mean, if, if we have, a, you know, and I hope we don't, but if we have, you know, an out and out fervent Nazi in the room, I doubt that I have any opportunity to change how they feel about it. But most people are not at one end of a spectrum or the other, right? Most people are somewhere in the middle. And if we have students who just really might never have thought about it that way and might never have given a whole lot of credence to maybe a little thing they read online here or there and might never have put it together in the big picture or might not have seen how it might matter to them, to their classmates, to their friends, to their family, to the people around, to our society at large. If we don't take advantage of the fact that we are actually literally the people with a microphone standing on a platform in front of a room, God, we're wasting our time. As you can see, you, we do have this, you know, the rise of uh, ultra right and all these things, you know, and also here in the, the Middle East or in the Arab world, we have this, you know, what we have been calling as uh, field states. So these are challenges. We have to look uh, what we as intellectual, what we as scholars are producing. Are we producing something to radicalize our society? Are we producing something to make our societies more self-centric? Or we are producing something that says that we are all a human family? And look at here, look at there, multiculturalism is the norm, not the exception. And uh, pluralism is a uh, norm, not the exception in the history of humankind. What, what we are seeing, what we are doing, 
That's, that's very important, I think. Even with these two long episodes, it feels like we've only scratched the surface of these topics. We would love to keep the conversation going in other podcasts like the Mirror of Antiquity and the Itinera podcast, which are both interviewing classicists about many topics and which have both touched on related issues, or on Twitter at All Endless Knot, or the Endless Knot Facebook page, or at alliterative.net slash podcast in the comments. Let us know what you thought about the things our guests had to say, and what ideas or suggestions or anecdotes you have to contribute. Thank you again to everyone who spoke to us. Catherine Blouin, Damien Fleming, Usama Ali Gad, Rebecca Fudo Kennedy, Issa Mittman, Dimitri Nikasas, Helen Young, and Donna Zuckerberg. More information about all of them are in the show notes, but in particular, we'd recommend you check out these blogs Everyday Orientalism, to which both Catherine and Usama contribute, Classics at the Intersections by Rebecca Fudo Kennedy, Aegean Prehistory by Dimitri, Classics in Arabic by Usama, and the online journal Eidolon, edited by Donna. Also look for Helen's book Race and Popular Fantasy Literature, Habits of Whiteness, and Ace's several books on medieval monsters, including Inconceivable Beasts, The Wonders of the East in the Beowulf Manuscript. Also, all of them, except Asa, can be found on Twitter, info in the show notes. We especially recommend following Damien at FW underscore Medieval for a wide range of delightful medieval manuscripts and history of English and more. And finally, we'll be putting a number of links in the show notes to further reading on these topics. In particular, the website The Public Medievalist has been running an amazing series on race, racism, and the Middle Ages, which we highly recommend. We'll be back in two weeks with an episode that returns to etymology with an exploration of the origins of the Mai Tai and discussions of cultural interactions from the ancient world to today. Thanks for listening. Bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.